Lord, 
Well, that was fun. Uh, man, nice job, choir. Uh, kiddos, you're dismissed. You would like to be? I got to get a look here for a minute as those maybe vases we haven't seen a little bit. Some, so, yeah. Man, uh, I, I feel like when, when, uh, when we have uh, a fuller sanctuary, the, boy, the worship is just fuller, huh? Um, it just, man, it feels good. So anyways, it, it's good, uh, man, good to worship with you this morning. Um, what a good time. Uh, we, we're going to go into prayer this morning before we get into the sermon. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a handful of things we continue to pray for. You know, we continue to pray for Art. Um, we continue to pray for Sheree. Her heart, her heart rate just runs a little too fast lately. Um, there's more to that story, some of you know. But, um, yeah, there's a handful of things. So let's, let's go to prayer. Um, Pray with me as we pray uh, for those things that you uh, that are on your heart, in your heart and mind, soul. So, yeah, let's pray. God in heaven, we are grateful for this day. We are grateful uh, that, that this day, as we celebrate Easter, uh, really gives shape to every Sunday throughout the rest of the year, that, that you have indeed resurrected, that you are indeed at work in the world, redeeming the world, that you are indeed at work in each one of us for our redemption, for our salvation, and for our sanctification. So God, we stand grateful. We stand in humble grace that you have stepped into our life and our world. For our goodness sake. God, for those who are fighting illness, God, I pray. I pray strength of body, strength of mind, strength of spirit in their midst. God, would you show up to each one who is fighting illness? Would you touch their bodies? Would you heal them ultimately is what we ask. Until then, God, would you be present and would you help them to know your presence with them, that you are indeed with us. God, we thank you for that story. We thank you for this story that we've been sitting in really for all of our time here, but certainly since Advent, as we prepare for your coming as a baby and live through the Christian calendar of Epiphany, Ash Wednesday and Lent and all these elements that shape the story and tell of your ultimate goal to win back humanity for your sake in relationship with you. So God, forgive us where we have found ourselves broken in our relationship with you, with others. Continue. God, to move in our hearts and our minds. God, that we are or become a sanctified people, a people set apart for your goodness in this world. As much as we see the brokenness and pain of the world, God, I pray that we would be a people that speak to life and wholeness for your redemption of it. So God, this morning... I pray that we hear a word from you, that my words would be words from you, and that which we all hear is from you. So God, would you be in it this morning? Would you be in our worship? Would you be in our speech? And would you be in our very countenance as we interact with one another? Thanks, God, for sending your Son to interact with us that we might live whole and full lives. 
Amen. Amen. So we're in um, the book of Mark this morning. So if, if, if you have your Bibles and want to turn with me, Mark chapter 16. Uh, Mark's an interesting one in the Gospels. Um, if you're wondering where that is, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. You know, so Matthew, Mark, the second book. Um, uh, Mark is, is, is shorter, and, and Mark has an interesting ending. We'll get to that in a minute. I'll read it. Um, Mark's ending is a little bit different than the rest, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but there's a phrase in there that I want to cling to and that I want us to uh, move in for this Easter morning. So starting in chapter 16, starting in verse 1, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they could go and anoint Jesus' dead body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they came to the tomb. They were saying to each other, who's going to roll the stone away from the entrance for us? When they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, and it was a very large stone. Going into the tomb, they saw a young man in a white robe seated on the right side. They were startled, but he said to them, Don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He isn't here. Look, here's the place where they laid him. Go tell his disciples, especially Peter, that he is going ahead of you into Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you. Overcome with terror and dread, they fled from the tomb, and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And that's it. And that's the end of Mark. And you might be with someone, well, wait a minute, Pastor. I have another ending. Yes, in fact, you have two other endings. <laughs> one is short, one is a little bit longer. But we don't need to get into all of that this morning except to say that historically scholars would say that this is indeed the ending of Mark. It's possible that he didn't finish for whatever reason. Maybe he died or maybe whatever thing we might try to conjure up. I don't know. Some scholars say he He just didn't finish. Uh, Other scholars say, no, he did finish. And still yet in the second century, those other two endings that your Bible probably has, there's a shorter ending and a longer ending, Those are historically thought to have been added by scholars, scribes in the second century. Those scholars, those scribes thought, well, Mark didn't finish, so let's finish. And so they added a little better finishing or better finishing. And the reason they know this is because, or they suspect this, is because the writing is slightly different. It seems to take on a different slide, a different countenance. Than, than the whole of the book of Mark. Uh, but that being aside, what I want to focus in on this morning is that statement. It was just as they had found it. That leaves almost, here's this big grand story that Mark tells, and then there's this statement, they, it was just as they had found it. In fact, everything that they had been told, it is just as They were told, dot, 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 go to Galilee and find Jesus there. You will find him there. So it's almost as though Mark left you hanging in order that as you participate in this story of the gospel message, you find yourself pining for more. What is going to happen now? In fact, Mark does this several times throughout his gospel. He leaves it with, and it was as they said it was. You might say that Mark left a few Easter eggs throughout the book. Chapter 11, Jesus sent his disciples to go find a colt. Remember this story? It's before he rides in on Palm Sunday. Hey, go find a colt. You're going to go into the city. You're going to find a little colt right there. It's going to be tied up, so go ahead and take it. It'll be fine. There's some, going to be some guys that ask you, hey, what are you doing? You're taking this colt. It's not even yours. What are you, you're just taking it? And Jesus tells them, well, just tell them that the Lord needs it. 
And so that's what they did, and that's what happened, and so they got the colt, and that's what Jesus rode in on Palm Sunday, and it was just as they had been told. It was just as they had been told. Chapter 14, Jesus sent two guys to go prepare the upper room. He said, go into the city, go into this place, go to this house, ask for a room, say, hey, where's the Lord going to have his his, his Passover meal, where's this going to be? And the guy's going to show you, he's going to tell you. And so then when the guys did go to the city and they went to this particular house, they asked him, hey, where's the Lord going to have the, the Last Supper? They said, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, it's going to be right here. They showed it, and it was just as they had been told. In fact, that story says those exact words. It says they found it, they found everything as he had told them. Mark goes on. Judas betrays Jesus and it was as it would happen. Peter denies Jesus, and it happened as he said it. Remember, Jesus told Peter, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Peter, no, 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 never. Yeah, in fact, you're going to deny me three times, and just after the third time, there's going to be a rooster, it's going to crow, and you're going to know what just happened. And a little while later, here it is, Peter denies him, no, 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 no. Cock-a-doodle-doo. <laughs> And Jesus goes, or Peter says, whoa. It was just as he said it would be. The disciples fled as it was told it would happen. Jesus was rejected as, it told, as he told it, was, it would happen. Jesus was delivered up, condemned, mocked, killed, and then resurrected as was prophesied would happen. So Mark instructs at the end of his book, it, is, it will be just as he told you. Go to Galilee, you will see him again, and it will be just as I told you. I can't help but think that throughout the whole of Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, we read over and over and over events that are told would happen, and then all of a sudden we read, oh my goodness, it happened just like they said it would happen. It happened just as they said it would happen again and again and again. Let me ask, what other things has Jesus said would happen? happen, or maybe let's ask more specifically, why did Jesus come? Huh? Save. To save. Somebody find me a passage in scripture. My son just walked out and this is his favorite. John 3.17 says, that's 16. We can go on though. Go ahead. Start with 16. Let's do it. For God so loved the world, everybody knows it, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life and Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world but to save the world or to redeem the world I wonder if we believe if it will be just as he said it would be do we believe that do we believe when Jesus said it I have come to redeem or do we simply live in the despair brokenness and angst of the world and say, woe is me, the world's bad except for me. I'm awesome, but the world is a disaster. I wonder if we as Christian people will actually live into the reality that first of all, Christ did indeed raise from the dead and the declaration of his resurrection is that we will participate in the resurrected life, which is living into a life that is about redeeming the world. Salvation. All too often, we are caught up in a salvation that is, man, I can't wait to die so I can go be with Jesus. Instead of a salvation that says, Jesus resurrected, that I too might resurrect from my sin and death and darkness. Even now, before my flesh dies, that I will be a blessing to the world, that my very life will be light and life for the darkness to be pushed aside. Why? Because the Spirit, the living God, we'll get to Pentecost in a couple weeks, has been breathed into humanity that humanity might live 
as light and life to the world. Hope. Hope that resurrection's real. Hope that new life can be had. And it'll start with me, not with you know, all those yahoos out there that need to be saved. No, it starts with me. God, help me to live into my salvation. Forgive me, God, where I have lived in darkness. Forgive me where I have wandered. Jesus tells a story throughout Scripture. There's a story particular, one of my favorite stories. I've been living in it the last couple of weeks, actually, in my personal time. And that is the prodigal. You guys know the story. Two sons. One son's great. Stays home. Does his chores. All the right things. Doesn't do bad stuff. You know, you know those guys. They're all... But then there's the younger son who's like, dudes, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of doing all the chores. I'm tired of living under my dad's thumb. I'm tired of just, you know what, dad, just give me my stuff. Give me my, give me my cash. Give me my inheritance. I'm, I'm out. I'm going to go do what I want to do. I'm going to go live my life. And so he does. He wanders into, well, the darkness. He wanders into that space that is far from the Father. He loses sight of the Father. He loses sight of the abundance in which the Father had to offer him. I'm going to step back so I don't keep making that squeal. Sorry if that camera just messed up Chris, but... So the younger son continues to do his thing, and it just spirals. Uh, Maybe you know. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you've felt that before. Maybe maybe you've been in that space where you've just been distant from the Father. You thought, no, you know what? I'm just kind of good as I am. am. I'm just going to, I'll be good. And it just seems to get deeper and deeper. Finally, the younger son is, you know, slopping with the pigs, starving to death. Even though the pig food looks good, it's not. (laughs) And he's just kind of in that pit of despair where he is lost, he's ashamed, and he tries to figure out, man, how can I get out of this? How can I get out of this mess I've made? And he starts trying to conjure up story. This is what I'll tell my dad. I'll tell him this. Uh, I don't know if that's good enough. Maybe I'll tell him this too. I'll, and, and you know, you know how it is. You wreck the car and you got to go home and face dad or whatever. And you're like, oh man, I got to tell him a deer ran out in front. Or maybe, uh, uh, I don't know, it was a dog. Or let's get our story straight, right? You start working up the story so that you can figure out how can I tell this story so that the impact is a little less. And there was something I learned not long ago, actually about this story that I found compelling. That in such a particular situation, when a son would come home, well, not necessarily a son, when anybody, when anybody had left a particular village in contempt, and wanted to come back. Often, the city people will race out to meet him. And they'll throw and break pots at his feet in protest of him, disallowing him to come into the city, saying, no, you're, you're done, you're out, you've screwed it up. They crash the pots at his feet to say you're no longer welcome here. It gives new meaning to the father looking from far off, waiting for his... The father knew that those pots were going to crack. And so the father ran to beat the city folk. The father ran ahead. 
He was watching from afar because he knew if his son showed up, the city would disallow him back into community. And so the father continued to watch for him so that he could beat the city to the punch and welcome his son back into community. The son knew this. The son had a big, long story about this. And the son lived hopeful that he would at least, at least he could be an indentured servant. But the hope that the son had was even greater, was bested by the hope the Father had. The greatest hope that we might have for our world will be bested by the hope that God has for his world. And we are invited to participate in that hope, to keep our eyes out for that which God is doing it's easy, right? You, we all, it's easy to see what the enemy is doing in the world. That's what sells news, is what the enemy is doing in the world. What sells news is all the bad stuff, all the bad people. You know, those guys. But Mark, particularly Mark, but I think the entire scripture are inviting us to open our eyes to a new imagination. The Jews in the first century, when Jesus was in the grave yesterday, Holy Saturday, when Jesus was dead, the, G, the, the Jews, the people, any of them, Jews, Gentiles, all in the, they did not have an imagination for somebody coming back to life. Much like you and I often don't have an imagination for somebody coming back to life. And Mark, in his statement, it has happened just as he said it would, over and over and over. He's trying to convince his audience that the story is not over. There's more to the story. Go to Galilee and you will find him. You will see him. You will meet up with him just as he said you would. And so even today, we are invited into this space and this story. Not just to hear it. Not just to read it but almost like stepping into the coat closet of Narnia and going into the world and participating within the world that is resurrection world. Jesus resurrected. Jesus sent his Holy Spirit into the world, into you and me, that we might live in a way that declares New life happens even out of our brokenness. Anybody have brokenness? Anybody find themselves wandering from the Father? Anybody find their mind in spaces that are not holy and righteous? But here in this story, there is a father calling. I wonder, I wonder if that young man in the pig slop heard a voice in his mind and heart calling him, hey, come home. Come home, son. Come out of that tomb you have created. Son, come home. There's a space. I wonder if he might have heard God in heaven speaking. Maybe it was his dad's voice. 
Maybe he knew how much his dad loved him, and he's slopping with the pigs, and he's hearing his dad's voice, hey, son, I miss you. Would you come home? I wonder often in that sentiment, I think even of if, you, if I dare step into another biblical story, when Jesus goes to Lazarus' tomb and Lazarus is long dead behind the stone and Jesus hollers out, Lazarus, come out! I wonder if that young son has ever heard a voice calling out to him, son, come out. Come out of that dark space you've been living in. Come out. Would you come out? Would you come out of that darkness? I wonder maybe if you've heard the voice. Two in the midst of your life, in the, in the midst of your dark places. In those spaces where you're feeling a little bit isolated. Maybe you're feeling a little pity. Maybe, maybe you're feeling a little humiliated in your heart. Maybe you're feeling a little shame, much like that young man in the pig slop. And maybe, maybe you've heard the voice of God crying out, Come out of that space. There's a place at the table for you still. I know, I know you're feeling miserable. I know, I know you're hurt. But but come out of that space. Come out of that darkness. There's a space for you. There is new life to be had even in the darkness. Come out. Would you come out? This story, we cannot live in the story of resurrection unless we understand death. Not not necessarily physical death, but soul and heart kind of death. There's, There's habits that we create within our lives that don't lead us to life. There's stories that we enter, be it on TV, the internet, or elsewhere that don't necessarily invite us to life. There's addictions that we pick up that only lead further into the pig slop. Usually those habits, usually those spaces are deeper and deeper into isolation. And I've heard it recently. But the opposite of addiction is not um, sobriety. The opposite of addiction is not sobriety, but community. That that when we find ourselves in those dark places, when we find ourselves slopping with the pigs, healing comes in a newfound relationship with the Father. That young man could have quit slopping with the pigs. He could have gone and find a better job. He could have gotten out of those habits. 
But if he didn't come back into relationship with the Father, he would remain distant from the Father. A couple more thoughts, if I may. The same story is the story of Adam and Eve. The same story. The story of Adam and Eve is yet to be seen on the other side. They've yet to come home, right? Humanity is still, we're still waiting for the end. But it's the same story. Adam and Eve saw what they wanted, and it was going to separate them for the, from the Father. And so they took it. They desired it and took it. And as a result, we're left, left the compound, left relationship with the Father. The story of Jacob and Esau is the same story. Jacob takes, swindles what was not his, breaks relationship with his brother and his dad. Now his relationship with his dad is based in deceit. Esau gives up his relationship with the father, his birthright, for a bowl of soup. The story of the scriptures tells over and over again of humanity's brokenness, humanity's sin, humanity's separation from the father. Over and over the story is told. And then, in the middle of time, in the middle of human sin and brokenness, God shows up in flesh and says, come home. Come come home. There's a place for you. Oh, but I've done this and this and this. Oh, if you only knew what I've done, come home. If you only knew what my heart and soul feels right now, you wouldn't invite me home. The father interrupts the statement and says, come home. There is new life found here. Resurrection life. Freedom, wholeness, new life with the Father. This is Easter. This is a story of new life. This is a great big grand cosmic story of the God of creation making all things new. You may have found yourself in sin, but the Father continues. And guess what? When you come home, it will be just as he said it would be. When you come home, it will be just as you were told it would be. Right relationship with the Father. Boy, howdy, that's good news. Any Oklahomans in the house? I don't have anybody from Oklahoma anymore. <laughs> Texas? Oh, Rod, you know that statement. Boy, howdy. <laughs> This is good news. This is resurrection news. And guess what? It ain't over. God is still at work in the world for the redemption of the world. And John leaves us with this dot, dot, dot kind of sentiment that says, oh my goodness, let me go out and find him. And when I do, it will be just as he said it would be that he is at work in the world. We can live in a dark space that continues 
to understand the world going to hell in a handbasket. Or we can live into the hope of Easter resurrection that says God is redeeming. Help me to see it because it's tough to see. God, help me to see it. But this is what you've been saying the whole time that I didn't come into the world to condemn it. I didn't come into the world to live into its sin and brokenness and darkness, all that. I came into the world to redeem the world, to make new the world. That's good news. And he says, anybody that would follow me into that new life. Don't follow him into that life. Don't Don't follow the hate you hear on the news into that life. Follow me into the world with the good news of resurrection, with the good news that Jesus is redeeming the world. Can anybody testify? I sure could testify. Not all of us set out into the world to look for trouble like that young son. Some of us may have. Most of us probably haven't. But maybe we've found ourselves in trouble. Regardless of where you've been. Regardless of where your mind and heart has been. The Father's still calling out. Come home. Come home. It'll be just as I said it would. Life, abundant. May we be a people so caught up in the story that it's as if we're in the story. (laughs) Because we are. The God of creation still at work. He's still at work in me. He's still at work in John. He's still at work in Ken, Jeff, Sarah, Christy, and Byron. He's still at work in Michael, Anthony. He's still at work in Dom. Do you hear him? hope you can hear him. I hope you're listening. Because he's calling out to all of us. There's more. There's more to this life than where you're at. You might be in a great spot. And God still says, come on. There's, there's more life to be had. Don't quit now. You're still upright. You're still living and breathing. There's more. There's more life to be had. You're not done. Come on. Keep going. Walk with me. (laughs) Allow me to transform you. We've been, I'll wrap it up. We've been in this sermon series, Jesus Living. And we've tried to shape it with particular practices and habits that, that might posture ourselves for right relationship with the Lord. So let me be clear here. The Lord's speaking regardless. That young man slopping with the pigs, he he wasn't really in a posture of righteousness. But I'm kind of convinced he still heard the Lord calling him. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do these things, that we shouldn't posture ourselves before the point is that regardless of where you're at, God is calling out to you. He is speaking to you. He is speaking to you what he wants to speak to you. So if it's your voice, try harder to listen to his voice. He is calling us all to a deeper, more profound life of faith. And what the scriptures tells us, what we'll find 
on the other side of that is life abundant. That's abundant life. That's eternal life. That's life in the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven that has indeed come to earth in the person of Jesus. And so we pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, help me to hear your voice. Help me to hear you speak life over me. And God, give me the courage to respond well. Because I believe life in Christ is a better life than life in Chris. So God, help me to put it aside. Help me to put me aside. I might live into Christ and his resurrection story. Amen? This is good news. May we be a people that walk about in our daily lives as people of resurrection. May we be a people that walk around in a dark and crazy world as light May we continue to be moved and shaped and drawn to a closer relationship with the Father. Amen. Happy Easter. He is indeed risen. May it show in us. Amen. 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 It is good to be with you today. I hope everybody got breakfast. I hope if you wanted it and you ate and... And there's probably even more if you need more, if you need lunch. Um, what a good day. It is good to be with you. Go in his peace.